Oh, perfect. Okay. We're just trying to find the right microphone. Could everybody sit down? We don't want to take away time from the speakers. Um, my name is Kay Dickerson. This session is called Trial Registration. Our first speaker is Dr. Anwen Chan, and he's going to talk about association of trial registration with reporting of clinical trials. Great. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. So there are several scientific and ethical reasons supporting the need for trial registration. In this talk, I'm going to be focusing on these three key goals. So firstly, registration helps to track the existence of all initiated trials. Secondly, it can help to identify and deter selective reporting of outcomes. And thirdly, registration aims to promote transparency. So what is the evidence that trial registration is actually achieving these goals? Well, empirical data are currently limited to studies that have examined cohorts of registered trials or cohorts of published trials. But what would give us the most complete picture is if we could examine the universe of all initiated trials in terms of assessing adherence to registration and potential impact on outcome reporting. So our study uh, examined three main objectives. The first was to assess the, the true registration rate based on a cohort of initiated trials uh, to evaluate whether there were discrepancies in the primary outcomes defined in the protocol compared with the registry as well as the protocol compared with the publication. And finally, to evaluate whether registration was associated with better reporting in subsequent publications. So our study cohort consisted of all clinical trial protocols approved by an ethics committee uh, in the region of Helsinki and Usama in southern Finland, the most popular region, populous region. And we looked at protocols approved in 2007 and 2002 to give them sufficient time to be published. We excluded uh, studies that were extensions of previously approved trials as well as trials that focused primarily on pharmacokinetic or economic outcomes or studies that focused on diagnostic accuracy properties. For each protocol that was approved, we identified corresponding registry records as well as published journal articles. So to identify registry records, we searched the WHO's uh, International Clinical Trials Registry Platform search portal, and we also used Google. We defined a prospective registry record as having been registered within 30 days of the trial start date. We also searched for journal publications, and our last search was conducted in February of 2017. We searched the usual electronic databases, so PubMed, Embase, the Cochrane uh, Central database, Google, as well as uh, three Finnish databases, uh, Medic, Arto, and Tuhat. From these three information sources, uh, we e extracted in duplicate all of the trial outcomes, and from the protocol, we extracted the trial characteristics. So our final cohort consisted of 248 trials across the two approval years. You can see that the vast majority were of randomized design. Um, the majority evaluated drug interventions, uh, involved multiple study sites, uh, over, just over 40% were industry sponsored, and 80% of the protocols defined at least one primary outcome. The median plan sample size was uh, 200, which is uh, Above, above average for clinical trials. So what do we find in terms of registration and publication rates? Well, you can see in red are trials approved in 2002 and in blue trials approved in 2007. So no trials approved in 2002 were registered compared with 61% of trials approved in 2007. In terms of publication, uh, the publication rates were around the usual 50% that's been shown in multiple studies over the past two decades. So I'm going to focus the rest of the results on the trials approved in 2007. There were 113 of these, and I'm restricting the rest of this talk on this, co on this sample because no trials in 2002 were registered. So as you saw in the previous slide, 61% of these trials were registered, 57% were published. So if we break this down, there were 24% of protocols which were neither registered nor published. 42% uh, were both registered and published. 19% were only registered but unpublished. And 15% were published but unregistered. 
we evaluated the trial characteristics that were associated with being registered, and you can see that having evaluated a drug intervention was significantly associated with being registered with a 31-fold uh, higher odds compared to non-drug interventions. And having a larger sample size above the median of 200 was also associated with being uh, registered. Our next objective was to evaluate cons consistency in the primary outcomes between uh, the registry and the protocol. And we found that 19% uh, of registered trials had changes to the protocol-defined primary outcomes, meaning that they either omitted a protocol-defined primary outcome or downgraded it to non-primary in the registry record. We found that 5% introduced new primary outcomes in the registry that had not been defined as primary in the protocol. And so overall, over a fifth of registered trials had inconsistent primary outcomes between the registry record and the original protocol. We next compared the primary outcomes defined in the published journal articles versus the protocol. And here we found 9% of published trials made changes to the protocol-defined primary outcomes. 13% uh, introduced new primary outcomes in the published article that were not defined in the protocol. And overall, 16% had major discrepancies uh, in the primary outcomes between publication and protocol. So our final objective was to evaluate whether registration uh, was associated with improved reporting. And we found that registered trials had a 4.5-fold higher odds of being published compared with unregistered trials, and that they were also almost six-fold, um, had almost six-fold higher odds of being published without any discrepancies in the primary outcomes between the protocol and the published article. And this, uh, these estimates were derived from multivariable logistic uh, regression adjusting for the study characteristics uh, I presented earlier. So what does this all mean? Well, we found that Registration was associated with significantly better reporting in terms of increased chance of being published without discrepant primary outcomes. However, we also found that fewer than two-thirds of trials were registered at all, and uh, that in almost a quarter of cases, uh, the registered primary outcomes did not match those in uh, the original trial protocol. So what can we do about it? It's clear that we need better adherence mechanisms for registration of all drug and non-drug trials. And this would involve uh, all stakeholders implementing and enforcing policies requiring registration for studies within their sphere of influence. And particularly uh, research ethics committees or uh, institutional review boards um, are the only real gatekeeper that see every single clinical trial or should see every single clinical trial that is initiated. So they can play a key role in ensuring registration. It's also important to ensure public access to the full study protocols as we have found that the registry records do not often reflect the primary outcomes in the protocol. And so it's important that these stakeholders also implement policies calling for public access to these documents. And further, um, that these documents actually can contain complete information. And this could be improved, as we found, uh, that 20% of protocols did not define a primary outcome. Uh, this can be improved by adherence to reporting standards for protocols, such as the International Spirit Guidance, which has uh, been widely adopted. And we are now developing um, a web tool uh, that will help authors to develop protocols based on Spirit and with the push of a button, upload and register information directly and accurately to clinicaltrials.gov so that there are fewer discrepancies. So just to announce that this, uh, this paper was published in JAMA online today. And to acknowledge my co-authors uh, on the study as well as the funders, um, the, the Academy of Finland and Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And I'd be happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Anwen. And um, when you come to the microphone, could you please announce your name and your affiliation? Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, um, Trish Groves, BMJ. Thanks, Anwen, that's great. Um, it's always interesting to see a study that starts with ethics committees. Um, and I wondered if anybody in the room is aware of any ethics committees that enforce trial registration. I'm aware of one, which is the national um, uh, a health research authority in the UK who will not 
approve a clinical trial done by anybody in the UK if that trial is not registered within six weeks of the first participant entering the trial, which is amazing and fantastic and good for them. But does, is anybody aware, I wonder, of any other ethics body that is enforcing trial registration as a condition of approval? And, and maybe, and when you're aware of some. Sorry, it's a very open question. Sure. I mean, I guess we can see a show of hands to see if... Oh, good. Very so few. few so I, I will say just from personal, so I'm the vice chair of our ethics committee um, and we do require it as do all University of Toronto oh, um, ethics committees. I will say though that it, it, the situation in the UK is not, certainly not the norm where you have a central body that can uh, dictate that all ethics committees must have this requirement. Uh, you know, when I worked at WHO to introduce the trial registration standards, we uh, advocated with the United States um, Primer, the organization that organizes a conference uh, for all IRBs and so on. Um, and we put forth to them that, you know, could you all help by requiring this? And it was clear that there, was, there were varying standards, um, varying policies across individual IRBs, at least within the United States. And so it is a, a challenging situation, but it would be great if ethics committees saw it within their remit, and I strongly believe it is, um, to introduce the requirement that all trials be registered as an ethical and a scientific um, requirement. And this would involve asking the question firstly and then making approval conditional on, on subsequent registration. Yeah, just a very brief follow-up. Whenever I talk to authors, I'm often surprised that many of them don't realize the ethical underpinnings of trial registration and they've never read the, the Ottawa Statement. Um, people think it's just red tape. They think it's bureaucracy. It's not. Nancy Lowe from the University of Colorado and also a journal editor. I'm struck by wondering if you had any ability to track those protocols in which the hypotheses were supported versus those that the hypotheses were not supported. Uh, and you know, the problem of, of non-significant results not ever getting published mm -hmm. is where I'm going. So we did look at um, whether the, dis the changes to primary outcomes, um, kind of the direction of whether that favored uh, the intervention or whether it did not favor the inter intervention or was neutral. And we actually found that, the, that it was scattered across those three categories. So it wasn't that all primary outcome discrepancies were always in favor of the intervention whether they were, it was an efficacy or harms outcome. So well, it, I was wondering about in relationship to whether or not it was published. Uh, we did not, so we did not look at that. Um, so yeah. our focus was on uh, consistency of reporting of outcomes. So we would have had to know the results of trials that never got published to see if and they the differ. And you don't have the and reports we don't have, in the registry. You don't yeah, have a we final don't have, report. Got we do it. Not. Yeah. Got it. Hi, Patrick Bosu, Amsterdam. Uh, it's, it's a great uh, study. My question is about changes in the primary outcome measure uh, between the first protocol submission and the trial registration. So do you find that unacceptable? Because it could be very well be that it makes sense actually to change the primary outcome measure and mm. it's a better understanding about the fallibility of the primary outcome measure mm. as long as you don't actually have access to the data yet. Yeah. So can we... Oh, actually I can have answer. It's almost like we planted this question. So if, you, <laughs> so if you have the protocol, then it's registered, and then it, there's amendments and so yeah. on, and then publication, right? So our comparison was between the most up-to-date protocol okay. uh, at the time of registration. So assuming, I mean, I assume if the, it was amended that the protocol amendment should have been submitted to the ethics committee before registration. So we would have compared the contemporary uh, information sources. Could I ask a question? I think we still have a moment. And I don't know if you looked at it, but just even if you didn't look at it formally, um, did you see variation in the protocols that were submitted? Because it's always a question I hear is what's a protocol? Yeah, it's, a, it's always a, a, a challenging issue. So when we, uh, as you know, when we developed the SPIRIT guidelines, the first question was, well, what exactly is a protocol? 
And it was clear, depending on which stakeholder or which individual within a stakeholder group you asked, that the definitions varied. So some would say, you know, it's our standard to always address, uh, you know, authorship guidelines in the protocol and other, or competing interests. And other people would say, oh, no, we never include that. That's in our manual of procedures or something. Um, so there's clearly um, no standard definition, but our goal with the spirit guidance was to have a minimum set of items that would kind of form the protocol. And that was in part kind of what arose from that initiative. But it, it's clear that depending on who you ask, um, a protocol may differ. Um, I think we should be able to agree though on what the key minimum information should be um, and what we should have access to up front to understand what is being planned for a trial. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much, Anwen. We can go on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Constance Chu, and she's going to talk about impact of FIDA on registration results reporting and publication of neuropsychiatric clinical trials supporting FDA new drug approval. Hello, everyone. My name is Kangsen Zhu. I previously published under the name Xuan Yi Zhu. Uh, the reason I decided, one of the reasons I decided to change my name is to reduce the amount of time it takes for people to figure out how to address me in the emails. <laughs> um, I am a third year medical student at Yale School of Medicine. Uh, I would like to thank my co authors. None of us have anything to disclose for this study. Um, Our research is motivated by prior work that showed publication bias is a serious problem. About 25 to 50 percent of clinical trials were never published. Trials with positive results were shown to be two to five times more likely to publish than trials with negative results. A seminal paper published in 2008 by Turner, who I believe is here, um, showed how selective publication might impact the perceived efficacy of antidepressants approved between 1987 to 2004. Of the trials that were determined by the FDA as positive, they were all published. Of the trials that were determined by the FDA as negative, the majority was either not published or published in ways that encouraged positive interpretations. If you were to look at published evidence alone, Turner concluded, that you would have the impression that nearly all antidepressant trials were positive, when in fact, half were not. The concern is that the results of many completed clinical trials were being swept under the rug and hidden from the public view. Many, including those of you who are sitting here, and uh, Awen just did, propose that a possible solution is to require all trials to register and to report results on the public trial registry, which can provide a means to keep track of which trials are published and which are not. This is precisely what the US Congress did. The Food and Drug and Administration Amendment Act was enacted on September 27, 2007, which I'll refer to from now on as FDA. FDA requires essentially all non-phase one clinical trials to uh, reg involving FDA regulated or approved medical products to register prior to study initiation and to report results on clinicaltrials.gov. It has been 10 years since the enactment of FADA and the publication of Turner's seminal paper on the selective publication of antidepressant trials. Our question is, has FADA resulted in fewer trials being swept under the rug? To answer this question, we chose a cohort of trials that we identified from the approval packages of FDA, um, of the approval packages of neuropsychiatric drugs, which is similar to the cohort used in Turner's paper. Our objective is to characterize the registration, results reporting, and publication for these trials before and after FDA. We excluded the drugs approved after 2014 to give the sponsors and investigators at least 24 months to report results and to publish their trials. Between the pre and post-FDA groups, 
we compared the rates of registration, results reporting, and publication. In addition, just like what Turner did, we also compared the rates of publication FDA agreement, which is when both the FDA and the publication claim that the trial results are positive, questionable, or negative. Here are our results. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, among all the drugs approved between 2005 and 2014 by the FDA, we found that 23 were approved to treat neurologic conditions, 14 for psychiatric conditions, which included three for substance use disorders. In the approval documents of these drugs, we identified the results of 142 efficacy studies, of which 101 were either initiated or completed prior to FDA enactment, and 41 were afterwards. Now is the results. Um, Pre-FDA, 64% trials were registered, and only 10% reported results. Post-FDA, 100% were registered, and 100% reported results. This suggests that FADA is associated with higher rates of registration and results reporting. Next are results on trial publication. Pre-FADA, 90% trials were published, of which 93% were published in agreement with FDA. Post-FADA, 100% were published, of which 98% were published in agreement with FDA. We provided the list and details of the publication with conclusions that directly contradict the FDA decisions in the slides using the QR code. Feel free to scan right now. As you can see, the differences of both outcomes were not significant. There does not seem to be an association between FDA and the overall publication rate and the overall rate of publication FDA agreement. Before we jump into a conclusion that FADA had no impact on the publication, publication of clinical trials, we decided to perform a subgroup analysis based on whether the FDA considered the trial results as positive, questionable, or negative. Here's what we found. FADA could not have had any impact on the publication of clinical trials. They were deemed by the FDA as positive. They were already 100% published in the pre-FADA period and remain so after FADA. We did observe the impact of FADA on the publication of trials deemed by the FDA as negative. Pre-FADA, eight out of 13 negative trials were not published. One negative trials were published as questionable and one as positive, both disagreeing with FDA. Only three out of the three pre-FADA negative trials were published as negative in agreement with FDA. In contrast, all five out of five post-FADA negative trials were published as negative in agreement with FDA. Although it appears that the sample size of the negative trials are small, but it does represent a significant improvement in terms of publication rate of negative trials. We did not show the data on trials with questionable results on this slide because there was only one such trial in the post fadat period. Here is a summary of the conclusions that we drawn from this study. FADAT was associated with higher rates of registration and results reporting but that was neither associated with the overall publication rate nor with overall FDA publication FDA agreement. However, our post hoc analysis suggests that FADA may be associated with higher publication rate of trials with negative results. There are a few limitations of our studies. We did not study other factors that could have influenced the registration, results reporting, publication of clinical trials such as the ICMJE recommendations. We did not search for registration records in other trial registries. Our conclusions may not be generalizable to studies supporting other indications, other types of drugs, 
post-marketing studies or studies not involving FDA-regulated medical interventions. That being said, a recently published paper involving trials supporting FDA approval of drugs treating cardiovascular disease and diabetes showed very similar results. Our studies have important implications. It shows that policy like FADA can be effective to prevent clinical trials from being swept under the rug, which in turn prevent bias from affecting the practice of evidence-based medicine. However, FADA only applies to FDA-regulated medical products. Similar policy should be considered for other types of interventions to reduce bias in the literature of other types of, in the, also a part of the medical practice, um, such as behavioral, surgical, and health system interventions. Thank you. All right, I guess I have to ask a question. Um, and I was thinking of, because you're a medical student, I don't want to put you too, uh, too much on the spot, but <laughs> how can you say FADA had the impact when it's not possible to look at cause and effect using the study design? I'm, it could have been some external factor, right? I absolutely agree. So that keeps, him up and keeps me up at night. Um, <laughs> that being said, I, I, I come to appreciate the importance of attempting to study the possible cause that could reduce publication bias. Um, I think more study definitely need to evaluate my claim, our claims, um, but it's important to acknowledge the impact of FADA because it really is a significant step made towards um, transparency. And another thing that probably you're getting in epidemiology one um, is at least I was always taught not to do a subgroup analysis unless the initial analysis shows something, which it did not. So you led to a post hoc analysis that presumably by that you mean it wasn't pre-specified. So are there other post hoc analyses that weren't done that might have shown something significant when your original analysis didn't? I'm just wondering again about the exploratory nature and what led you in that direction. Uh, I also completely agree. Um, so uh, I think that reflects um, our lack of, uh, lack of foresight because we already observed nearly 100% publication rate in Turner's paper. So we should have thought that we're not studying a group of, uh, like we're not studying a homogeneous groups. Um, so uh, we also are very cautious what, uh, to conclude the impact on the negative trials. And we, I, I believe I use the term may suggest. It's not you I'm worried about. It's, the, it's how others will interpret uh, your results. Thank you. Any other questions? Don't be shy, or is it just postprandial tiredness? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so our last speaker is Rebecca Williams who is going to talk about evaluation of the clinicaltrials.gov results database and its relationship to peer-reviewed literature. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm the assistant director at clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, the work that I'm presenting today uh, is with the authors that you see listed on the slide. Our primary disclosure is that we depend on clinicaltrials.gov for our paycheck. Um, I think we all probably uh, across the podium too could have shared the same background slide. I think that the key point um, here is basically that 
policies and laws have really impacted the landscape that we currently have available. And the ICMJE policy in 2005 really allowed us to begin getting at a better denominator for what trials are actually available, knowing that the published literature isn't reflective of all of the clinical trials conducted. Um, in 2007, when FIDA was passed, it also further expanded the requirements here in the U.S. for trial registration, and more importantly, it added a requirement um, to submit summary results information to clinicaltrials.gov for certain clinical trials. These trials are of FDA-approved drug, biologic, and device products, and there is a requirement to submit these results within one year of the completion of the trial. Um, also of note, just this year at the beginning of 2017, the results reporting requirements have been expanded so that they will include unapproved products as well under the legal requirements. Um, so since the launch of the results database, we have had an intense interest in evaluating and ensuring that it's actually meeting the intended goals that were set out by Congress and the general um, kind of population. And so at the last Congress, we actually presented a framework that was intended to begin to evaluate if the results database was actually meeting the goals um, that had been stated. And so one of those goals is clearly to increase the um, amount of results information that's available uh, to the public. And so in the, in the abstract that you have in your program, we looked at two different samples. Um, the first was just a cross-sectional sample looking at all results that were posted on clinicaltrials.gov. At the time, it was 24,000 studies. We now have 28,000 studies. The key here is that really, when results are posted on clinicaltrials.gov, most often there is not a corresponding publication. And you can read more about those results in, in the abstract itself. What I really wanted to focus on today is the second sample that we took that's focusing on this concept of a drug family. And really the idea of looking at, at this drug family sample was to be able to take a perspective that was more in line with how you might be looking for results information and that you're likely to be looking for information on a specific drug and a specific condition. And so we grouped our, our trials into what we call drug trial families that represent a single drug condition and sponsor. Uh, we focused on studies that were registered on clinicaltrials.gov as of December 2014. We limited it to phase two through four uh, clinical trials of drug or biologic products with a location in the U.S. Um, and those studies that were sponsored by industry. We also uh, limited our sample to those studies that completed or terminated in this window of January 2007 to December 2009. We wanted to ensure that we had adequate follow-up uh, for the studies that were included in this family sample. Um, we ended up then taking a convenience sample of those uh, trials that met those inclusion criteria. Um, there were about 3,000 studies in that initial sample, and our sample ended up being about 329 trials grouped into 96 drug trial families. For each trial then, we assessed whether there were, result there were results posted on clinicaltrials.gov or publications available in PubMed. And we looked at this at two different dates. We've updated it since also it was uh, published in your program. So we looked in January of 2016 and then again just a month and a half ago. When we looked in July, we also assessed the drug approval status um, of, of the products that were being, uh, the trials that were being reported. And just to make sure that everyone understands this concept of drug trial family, you can see here an example of kind of the groupings of what a family rep would represent. Um, in the middle, uh, you see a drug trial family number one, which is representative of three different trials. They are all sponsored by Allergan. They are all looking at the drug botulinum toxin type A, should have picked a shorter name, and the condition uh, torticollis. And then another drug trial family is actually the same sponsor, same drug, but a different condition. So those represent unique drug trial families. Um, focusing first on the results related to the clinical trials themselves, as I said, we had 329 clinical trials in our sample, representing 86 different drug products, 78 conditions, and 45 different companies, and that resulted in 96 unique families. There were about three trials per family with a range of anywhere between two trials. You had to have a minimum of two trials to equal a family unit and a maximum of 11. 
Um, the results that you see here, again, are the, the clinical trial, uh, the per clinical trial analysis. And so you can see overall the rates of, report, of results reporting for the clinical trials in our sample um, was 71% when we first looked and then increasing to 78% when we just checked again in July. Um, what's significant is in that first group, you can see that 33% of trials are, are represented in clinicaltrials.gov only, representing nearly half of the trials that had results publicly available. Um, that number dwindles over time as more time is allowed for then the publication process and results then become available in both publications and in clinicaltrials.gov. When we looked at the FDA approval status of the drugs that were being studied in the clinical trials, um, we found that the rate of overall results reporting was higher. So of those trials that had FDA approved drugs, 86% of those trials um, had results publicly available. Of those trials that were not, that did not have drugs that were FDA approved, the rate was six, closer to 60%. Um, and you can see again that about a th almost a third of the trials in, in that group were available on clinicaltrials.gov only. When we looked at the results uh, based on the drug condition sponsor family groups, those 96 families, uh, we grouped it based on whether or not results reporting was complete for the family. So were all trial results available for one particular family? We found that when we most recently looked at the data, about 60% of the families had complete results available, leaving the remainder to either have partial results available for the family or no results available for the family. Um, some limitations associated with this particular sample is that we only focused on those studies that were registered on clinicaltrials.gov. We did limit the sample just to those studies that were industry sponsored, trying to keep the trials under the control of one individual, one entity. Um, we did take a convenient sampling approach for that, for that um, drug family analysis, and we did limit our, um, our sample based on a very specific time period of trial completion, um, that January 2007 to December 2009 period. Um, and that time period also um, didn't uh, specifically align with the legal requirements uh, for reporting, so it's hard to kind of associate those, those two things. Um, but in terms of the potential implications of the research, it's really clear that the results database is proving to be a unique source of results information when it isn't otherwise available in the published literature. And I think there's a lot of really interesting questions about how journals and others can leverage that information when it is available. Um, through the publication process, we've seen a couple really unique examples right now. The uh, New England Journal of Medicine has published two articles in which there were a large number of secondary outcome measures, and not all of the results for the secondary outcome measures were reported in that particular publication, but instead the publication referred to clinicaltrials.gov in order to see the full breadth of those secondary outcome measure results. Um, it's also interesting to think about how journals could leverage the information when it is available on clinicaltrials.gov for consistency checks, and I think also uh, similar to the outcome measures, referring to adverse event information in the database as well. Um, the overall rate of results availability does seem to be improving, um, but it was a little bit disappointing to still see that the reporting of a family on its own, um, we still have incomplete results for these families of drug trials. Um, we're really hoping that with the expansion of the legal requirements that will continue to expand the availability of, of results information. This is like on an automatic thing. Um, one of the other, <laughs> I'll just make another point on the thank you slide. I think one of the other things to consider is the role of journals. Um, when it is known that there is this drug trial family that is, exists, and if there is one trial that's unreported, what is the role of acknowledging that unreported trial or asking questions about it or making it known at least that this um, exists. And I think that's a responsibility of the investigators and the sponsors, um, potentially as well as, as the journals. So thank you. While we're waiting for people to come to the microphone, could you explain families to me? So I'm sorry. <laughs> that's why I took extra time, because I, I had a hard trouble wrapping my head around so, it too. I just want to understand, a drug trial family is never um, 
just one trial. It's always more than one. In this analysis, yes, you had to have at least two trials to equal a family. And it's never because you were afraid that maybe it was the same trial, one and two, that they were talking about. It was more because it looked like it was sequential. Yeah, it was more that we were just trying to assess this denominator, sort of what evidence is available on this topic. And so we felt it fairer, I guess, to be looking at more than one and weren't really sure how that tale of single studies was going to impact the overall So result. I guess that's the final question I yeah. have, which is, why did you feel it was necessary to analyze by families? It, was there some potential confounding that... Well, I think what, what the families gives you, it's really more, when you are interested in looking at a particular topic, you're typically interested in looking at a particular drug in a particular condition together. And so we wanted to take an approach that was more similar to what you might be doing in real life. When you look at kind of this cross-sectional approach, and even you could see with our clinical trial results, um, you could see we had, it was, I forget what the exact number is now that I'm, I'm moving on, but the results are really different when you group them by trial versus when you group them by family. And when you look at them by family, it gives a better sense of um, kind of that overall approach within a specific domain. Okay, at least I was understand our thinking. it. <laughs> and Deborah, do you have something to add to that? <laughs> so another way of thinking about it is we, part of our evaluation of, of clinicaltrials.gov in general goes back to some of the foundational scandals, if you will, to say, could those still happen? And one of those was Paxil. So remember, the issue was that GSK had done, or Smith Klein Beecham had done many trials of Paxil for depression in children, but only one was published. At, you know, originally one was published. And that was not a random sample of all the trials they had done. So the question was, could that still happen? So that's part of it. So we're looking at a body of studies by the same sponsor on the same topic to see whether clinicaltrials.gov and the policies surrounding it have improved the situation so that you can no longer do five studies and decide which one to publish after you see all the results. That, that was the thinking. But I just, well, I don't want to take away from the other people, but <laughs> let's say if they aren't, if there isn't a long line that we'll get back to that question. Okay. <laughs> I may be breaking the rules of engagement here, but I'm, I'm kind of uh, intrigued with the difference between your results and the results of the previous presentation. Um, and aside from you know whether something's dealing with an FDA-approved drug or not, but you know why you have 90 to 100 percent publication rate in, in the previous versus what almost everybody else sees, and can you think of any characteristics why that would be the case? I think I may have just gotten an idea what the answer was from that question, but. Um, it, if there is something that, that makes people much more likely to publish it, do you know what it is and what we could do to try and mm -hmm. motivate people to do so? Yeah, it's a great question. And actually, yesterday I was talking to Constance, and she had that same anticipatory question. She said, people may ask us why our results are different. Um, and I said, oh, well, yeah, let's talk about that. So I think a lot of it does actually have to do with our sampling approach. That, that study was, really, was focusing on drugs that had been approved by the FDA. Um, and you could see in our sample, our reporting approach 90% um, when you took into account the approval status. Um, so I definitely think that was probably one of the main differences. And then also the timeline. Um, we chose studies that overlapped um, with the time period of um, implementation of FDA. Um, and so some studies weren't required to report that were included in our sample. So it's kind of hard to tease out those two issues. Um, in terms of the other question, in terms of what the factors are associated with publication, um, that's a harder one to get at. I think a lot of our experience in working with investigators who have not published and are not planning to publish is just that they haven't taken the time to do it. Sorry. Michael Mullins, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, in, in, your, in your slides and in, in the published abstract, I was, it was not clear exactly what the convenience sample was, until it, I, I, but it appears to be the convenience sample yeah. is ability to put into a family. Uh, and, and, and that's fine, a convenience sample is okay as long as people know what, what, what the limitation is. Yeah. But I'm also curious, uh, it, it just as we learned earlier, uh, that the industry-funded trials are more likely to have, have some compliance with with established guidelines and so forth, because those may represent uh, the CROs or the, or, the, or the sponsors having more resources to, to assure compliance because they want to get publication and so forth. Uh, 
but in, in the clinical trials database, as, just as there are a bunch of, of uh, Allergan or, or any other company you know, uh, trials, there are also some, we'll say orphans, of entities, researchers, uh, or companies that have one trial uh, that's in, in clintrials.gov. I'd be interested in, in to see, uh, to know by comparison what happens with the, with the orphans in, in clinicaltrials.gov as well as the, the families. Yeah, I agree with you. We would also be interested in understanding that, that last question in particular, even, you know, within this particular sample of the families, because we limited it to studies that were done by a single sponsor, it's possible that someone at your university could also be doing a study on botulinum toxin type A on torticollis, and how does that affect kind of the overall results and, and results availability. So I definitely agree in terms of that, that follow-up. Um, the first question in terms of our, our convenience sample and approach, yeah, we basically kind of went down the list and started putting things into drug families until we ran out of time. And so that's kind of the, the way that it went, but there were potentially many other drug families that could have been created from that initial 3,000 trials. Thank you. So we'll hear about the orphans four years from now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll keep following up. Uh, Hilda Bastian, thanks. Just without going into a real lot of detail, uh, how did you search PubMed? So just to get a sense of um, how likely you were to have found studies that were in PubMed, uh, and then whether you've got any idea how often these studies are published outside PubMed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, our methods were first looking at whether or not we actually had a link to the publication in the clinicaltrials.gov record itself. Um, we automatically include links to publication when that NCT number is indexed in, in Medline. So if it was there, um, that, and it appeared to be a match, then we actually went to the publication to verify that it was actually the results of the clinical trial, because sometimes it is possible that um, the links that are added are not necessarily the results. Sponsors and investigators can also manually add to the study record their own links to publications, and it could be background information also, so it definitely did require verification. And then we use basically key information from the study record itself. Um, to verify the information in PubMed, so looking at the investigator name, the drug, um, the condition, and I can't remember all of the other items, but we have described that in, in other research that, that we've done as well. Break the rule, go for it. No. Um, so um, this is, goes back to the question one of the differences between our study and also between my study and other studies that reporting uh, drugs approved a similar period. Uh, I think one of the differences I may venture to guess is that I utilize the Google Scholar to triangle uh, publication, uh, PubMed record. Uh, PubMed, not to, I love PubMed, but one of the, pro, uh, one of the uh, barrier for me to search in PubMed is that uh, when the search is only limited to the title and abstract, sometimes the characteristics that I'm searching for is in the documents, in the, the full text. And so Google Scholar have a variety of uh, PDF full text submitted by people to like researchgate.com or other uh, websites. So they allows me to identify. And once I found the correct title, it goes back to PubMed and I was able to find all of them in the PubMed. Go ahead, uh, Gerben. Gerben uh, University of Amsterdam. Thanks for an intriguing talk. I also struggled, like uh, Kay Dickerson, with, with the concept of a drug trial family. And so <laughs> it suddenly reminded me of a, a paper by Ioannidis and um, uh, Carissa in the BMJ of 2010, where they, where they um, advise people that do re uh, systematic reviews to look at the wider research agenda. And so, um, let me just read what they, what they say. They say, when an intervention shows effectiveness for only a tiny fraction of tested indications, seemingly promising results may be false positives. So to me, that means that maybe we, we should even look at larger concepts than drug families, but look at whole fields of indications that pharma industry might, might be doing research on. So my question to you is, could we exploit um, clinicaltrials.gov in, in a maybe in a more extensive way to, to follow that advice? The simple answer is yes. <laughs> Great idea. Let's collaborate then. <laughs> 
I had a question, Becky, that, um, and it's unrelated to, I think, what's been said so far. You added at the end something that I thought was sort of intriguing based on something I think we heard yesterday, although I lost all track of time. Um, and that was about supplementary information, mm -hmm. that you thought maybe this was a place it could go. And we heard yesterday that the supplementary information that's online at journals can take up a lot of room. So are you working with any journals or is that what you're saying is maybe the supplementary information that's now online at the journals could go to clinicaltrials.gov? Because it seems to me we're putting information in so many places mm -hmm. that it's tough on the person just trying to figure out what to use, so is that yeah. what you were talking Yeah, absolutely, and I think one of the slides, actually I don't think Deborah included it in her slides yesterday, but she referred to it, is that we do like to think about clinicaltrials.gov as a potential scaffold in which to hang things off of, and because you know we link to journal publications and journal publications link back to us, it seems like a very natural fit to leverage those connections uh, to be able to show the data that can't be shown in each of the different sources alone, and especially now that we have the ability um, to accept protocols and have those available also, it will continue to be a really um, rich source of, of data, so really thinking about how these things um, can be complementary to each other. And are you working with any journals or other places just to make sure we don't have studies showing disagreement in protocol supplementary information, et cetera, that <laughs> in fact the same information is two places or one place. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we, we definitely in this case, you know, had some interaction with, with the journal and I think this serves as a good model and we're happy to talk with anyone at any point in time in terms of how best to approach this and there's always the potential to write up kind of a, an SOP when thinking about different things like this and how to make it easier for all to follow it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for any of our um, speakers? anything about trial registration. You've got the experts in front of you, so. Okay, well now then, thank you very much um, for your talk. And what we're, we're going to go to the poster sessions for the next hour until 3.30, and you can eat too. But um, the poster sessions are upstairs, and uh, make sure that you look at the posters. They look really interesting to me. And see you back here at 340.